All right. So what does all this add up to? Five practices. Um, I think I want to wrap this up with a story and then a song. I'm not going to sing the song, don't worry. But first, I want to say one thing about this election that we just went through. This was really different. Um, the significance of race as a political category in American politics and the significance of not moving beyond racism uh, has been devastating to our country and to its history. Founded half slave and half free, the reform power of government was always hamstrung from the beginning. Even when slavery was abolished, a resurgent South maintained control of the Senate, the Supreme Court, other federal institutions. So whenever anyone would try to organize around class concerns, the race card would always trump everything else. Forty years ago, the Civil Rights Movement challenged this ancient arrangement to its core. And it was a challenge in which government played a key role responding to social movements, becoming a mechanism of change, and it was the racial reaction to that change that was hijacked by conservatives to undermine government itself as a way of managing inequality or anything else. And that's what we're seeing the remnant of at those healthcare things. Well, that's come undone. Just as the election of our first African-American president has irretrievably altered the politics of race. And don't confuse what I'm saying. I'm saying racism is over. But I'm saying race is a political category. When North Carolina and Virginia vote for a black man for president, that really means something in terms of our history. And it comes as a time when the limits of the conservative view of government could not lie in greater tatters. That's what makes this a moment of opportunity. In the words of Seamus Heaney, a time when hope and history really can rhyme. Now my story. And the story is the story of David and Goliath. You know the story, right? You think you do, all right? Just, just think about this for a moment, okay? So, uh, you know, the story the Philistines and the Israelites are having at it, you know, this, some things never change, and that, that was kind of going on. And the Philistines had a big, uh, powerful warrior, Goliath, and he came and uh, was uh, taunting the Israelites every day. Uh, I'm a big warrior, send your powerful man against me, and we'll go mano a mano, and if he wins, then I'm yours, and if you win, if I win, then you're ours. Uh, and it was sort of these yomamas went on day after day after day. Uh, and uh, one day there was a young shepherd boy who was 14 who was sent by his brother to bring food to his, uh, by his father rather, to bring food to his brother who were soldiers. He was not a soldier, he was a shepherd. And he went up on this hill where his brothers were to bring them lunch. And he watched this scene unfolding with Goliath. And uh, David said, just looks at it, he says, wait a second, he says, this can't be allowed, this is... This is an insult to the ranks of the living God. This can't be allowed. And his brothers, what do they say? Don't make trouble, kids. Shut up. You know, don't, don't, you know, don't. He says, no, no, this is an injustice. It must be dealt with. And he goes to King Saul and he says, King Saul, I'm your man. I'm going to fight Goliath. And King Saul says, forget it, kid. You know, you're not qualified. You don't have the experience. You know, you don't know. And he says, yeah, but King Saul, you don't have anybody else. I'm who you've got. He says, well, you got a point. He says, you got a point, but I'll tell you, I'm going to let you go fight on one condition. And the condition is that you have to take my sword, my shield, my helmet. And you're going to need to use those to confront this mighty warrior. What does David do? He puts them on. And he puts them on, he finds he can't move. And that's when he looks down at his feet and he notices five smooth stones in a little wadi there. And he looks at those stones and says, wait a second, I'm not a, I'm not a soldier, I'm a shepherd. And as a shepherd, I knew how to protect my flock from the wolf and from the bear. And it wasn't with a sword and a shield, it was with a stone. Maybe Goliath is just another wolf, just another bear. He takes off the armor, picks up the little stones, puts them in his pocket or in his pouch, goes to face Goliath. And what does Goliath do? laughs. And in the middle of the third laugh, a stone in the forehead. What's the moral there? There's a moral there about strategy and about being a successful insurgent. The first is 
David did not condition his, feasib his, his strategy on feasibility. He didn't set out to McKinsey for a, a feasibility study of defeating a giant. He said, this is an injustice. I commit to dealing with it. And what it teaches is that strategy, good strategy, is rooted in commitment. Not commitment conditional on strategy, but strategy driven by commitment. It's two very different ways of thinking about it. The second thing is he goes to the king, and the king gives him the conventional wisdom, right? You want to fight the powerful? Well, you need what they got, right? You need more of what they got. David bought it at first. Very easy to buy that argument. What did he learn? You don't build a good strategy out of what you don't have. You build it out of what you do have. You build it out of what you can do, not what your opponent can do. You build it out of your strengths. You build it out of your five stones and your little sling and what you know how to do. And that's number two. And number three, David was an outsider. He was the one sh shepherd who wasn't a soldier. The soldiers all thought power was swords and shields. And David, because he could see with an outsider's eyes, he was able to creatively reimagine that battlefield and see resources and opportunities no one else did and had the confidence in his imagination to be able to do that. And finally, what about Goliath? What about Goliath? Well, Goliath did the same thing Cesar Chavez used to tell us, power makes you stupid. And what he meant by that was that sometimes when you're so used to relying on an overwhelming preponderance of might, whether it's economic or military or political, you stop thinking. And that's what creates the opportunities for the Davids of this world to succeed. And that is where your opportunities are going to come from. And now the song. In the fourth grade, I was told, please mouth the words, so I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> but this was from the 1960s, and uh, it was a movie, The Inheritance, made by the Amalgamated Clothing Workers. And it sort of expresses a little bit about how, I remember I said I was, this is the second bite out of the apple, uh, sort of about how I feel about this time that we're living in right now. Um, and uh, Judy Collins made a, made a recording of it, uh, and it goes like this. Freedom doesn't come like a bird on the wing doesn't fall down like the summer rain. Freedom, freedom is a hard won thing. You have to work for it, fight for it, day and night for it, and every generation has to win it again. Pass it on to your children, brother. Pass it on to your children, sister. They have to work for it. They have to fight for it, day and night for it. And every generation has to win it again. Pass it on to your children. Pass it on. Thank you for the opportunity to pass some of it on.